Welcome to part two of lecture seven. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the known position of this end effector, this orange ball here, and use that to figure out what values over here join that. A nice way to think about it is uh, we've got this end effector position that's somewhere out here. And we want to figure out, well, how do we move these three joints in order to meet up with that? So that we can get our robot right at that desired point. So let's get started. Now here is that robot we've been looking at. And so you see it's got three joints in here and I've drawn in this plane here is an X zero, Y zero plane. So remember we can rotate our robot. As we rotate, all it's doing is rotating with regard to this Y zero, X zero plane. We can tilt the second angle up or we can tilt it downwards. And then finally, we can extend our final frame. So here I'm extending that point outwards. Now something that'll be handy for us to do when we move into inverse kinematics is to start projecting our robot onto the different frames that we care about. If we start at the, the final frame, this is just where is this X3, Y3 plane. This one's not so interesting. Let's see what happens if we project it onto frame two. So when we project onto frame two, the only thing that moves is we can extend this final degree of freedom outwards, right? Because all the previous joints are just gonna move that entire frame with it. And so there's no relationship change with that. A frame that is interesting for us when we do inverse kinematics is this X1, Y1 frame. So let's orient ourselves to be facing directly onto that. Just remember, as we rotate our theta one, this frame is moving with us. So if we just focus ourselves onto this frame, once we're stuck onto this frame, then our theta two is gonna rotate us around here just in an arc on there. And so the reachable space in any of these planes, X1, Y1, or something that is parallel with this plane, is just gonna be an arc that we can move along. That's gonna help us. So for the inverse kinematics problem, we are given the robot, we are given its DH parameters, and somebody tells me, I want the end effector to be at some location where we're gonna call the origin, we'll just call it OC. I want that to be at some X, C, Y, C, Z, C. They're saying, how do we get this orange point here, that robot, at some location? We wanna map that onto what is theta one, theta two, and D3. That is the inverse kinematics problem. And this is a challenging thing to think about. So the trick we use is that we project this robot onto those planes we were talking about. And so what we're going to do is first draw a cross section of the manipulator's workspace in the X1, Y1 at Z1 equals one. And then we're going to do a projection into the base frame X0, Y0. And then we're also going to look at what is a cross section at another point in this uh, base frame. And then after we do that, then we can solve for our theta two, D three, theta one. So before we go any further, it's important that we understand what are the constraints on our robot. So this robot, it says that theta one can only go between zero and pi. So that's gonna go all the way until this direction. So half a rotation. Theta two is going to be more constrained. It's only going to go between zero and pi over two. So you can go from pointing in this direction to pointing straight up. But that is going to be my limit on my theta two. And then my D two is always going to be between one and two. And so there's a limit to how far it can send out. So it's going to be somewhere in this distance here. And those are important as we try to draw this. The first thing that we've been asked to do is to draw the workspace of the manipulator at X1 on the X1, Y1 plane. So this is X1 and this is Y1 at some depth Z1 equals one. Where is that? Well, we know in this picture that we have here, this right here is our O1 frame. And our X1, Y1 is extending this way, which means that our Z is extending this way. So we are looking one unit along in this one unit here, and we want a plane that's going through here at that point. If we looked at this thing, here is my X1 point out here. We're asking for the plane that's extending through this that is has its origin at 
1. If we looked at this, we're taking this, this frame right here, and we're going to project it forward into here. And so finally, I could try to draw that on here. I'm taking this frame, this is my zero point, and I'm extending and looking, what does this robot look? Where's the workspace that it can reach in this point? And so the origin of my frame, I, I like to draw in my robot to help understand that. And so here is my joint number two. It says that zero, zero in frame one. Um, and then it, it's attached down to the base frame, which is at zero, zero in the base frame. But in my frame, it's a negative one in my y direction. So my y is pointing upwards. If this theta two is at zero, then its arm is pointing off to the right here. It extends one unit out here. So here's that arm sticking out to the right here. And then I know that I can rotate this thing. I can rotate it upwards. This is my theta two. And so I can rotate it all the way up. So that it's pointing here. My end effector is there. And I know that my, that OC point that I care about, draw that in orange. It's right here. If it's at theta two is all the way up and it's here if theta two is down. And so it follows this circular arc as it goes through here. And so the radius of this arc, it's always going to be the length of this arm, which is always one. So there I've got my projection of the workspace into frame X one Y one. The next frame that I'm looking at is I want to draw and shade the X zero Y zero cross section of the manipulators workspace at Z zero equals one. First, let's see if we can understand it. So we're taking our X zero Y zero frame. We're translating it up one unit to this is C zero equals one right up here. And we're taking this whole frame here, this whole cross section there. And so if we looked at it, what we're doing is we're actually putting it at the center of this joint here. And we're trying to see what is a projection into that frame. If I wanted to draw that up, I'm taking my frame, which was here on X zero, and I'm going to translate it upwards. So I'm seeing what is the workspace projected into this frame. So we can go ahead and we, we know that deep below us is that first joint, but what we're looking at is what happens um, to my next joint. And so my next joint is my rotational joint, which in my base frame, I've got it extending over by one unit. And then I've got my prismatic joint, which is always either one unit or it can extend out to two units. And that's just one position. I like to draw my robot in a few different configurations. If I put my theta one at pi over two, then my next joint, let's draw that in this ugly yellow color. Then I'll have rotated this joint over here, which means that I go one unit forward. There is my prismatic joint, and it can stand either one unit all the way out to two units. And then I can rotate this farther. Let's pick another ugly color. Here's an ugly green. I could rotate this, and so now it's facing the opposite way. It's coming out one unit. This is where my prismatic joint is. That's pointing upwards, and it goes either one, two, two. And now what I can do is just link these similar points together. So I'm going to link this outer one. It's going to, anytime you do a rotation around a point, everything attached to that is going to follow a circular trajectory. So this is a perfect circle that I'm drawing through here. And you can just laugh and uh, my perfect circle isn't so perfect. This interior point is also an interior point. And the region then that we can access in here is everything inside here. So I can shade that in expertly with that. The next thing I need to do is identify what these radiuses are. Although we know that this is going to be one and one are two here, I want to know what this distance over here is. So the Pythagorean theorem tells us, oh, that's obviously the square root of two. Whereas my longer distance over here is one and this is two here. So then the square root of five. So I have this patch here that is defined by two circles and then these straight lines on the edges. Let's look at the next projection, which says draw and shade. Now we're taking the Y zero zero cross section of the manipulator's workspace at X zero equals zero. And we need to label the endpoints. Well, where is that? Well, that plane is going to be aligned with our Y zero, which I can bring my Y zero out here and my Z zero here. So it's this plane here. 
I want to see what does that look like. My x0 is pointing in this direction. That means that my y0 is pointing in this direction. And so I'm looking for this plane if I'm looking straight down on it. Or I can draw in you know, this plane right here. Or in this drawing, I could say I'm going to take this plane right here and see where can I project my robot into it. So let's draw where that is on my x0, y0 picture. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a line, this project of this plane, which projects down to this line here. So we know that there's definitely going to be a component along here that we hit. Uh, there's actually also going to be a component here because we could take this, this final joint here and we could rotate that up and we'll get a point along there. Let's go ahead and let's draw that in our other frame. So I've got my robot, its first joint is sitting here. We go upwards to my joint there, and then that joint can rotate from down to up. And this component that we have over here, well, that happens when we are rotated down. So when it's rotated all the way to the side, so let's let's draw what this robot could look like. Right, so we, in order to get this point that's right here, if I want to get all the way towards the interior, then in order to reach that, I'm going to be one unit away from it. And then here's my, my projection, and I come over here. And so I'm, I'm, I've kinked my hand into, it's always at this 90 degree, but this is with the shortest distance. And so I've got a point, this right here is a square root of 2. Then if I want to hit this point, this is 2 length over here coming over. And so this that length is 2, uh, 1 in this direction. And so that total distance here is a square root of 5. So the bottom of my point is there. The other thing that I can do is I can rotate my arm so that it's all the way upwards. And then it can extend out to the side. And it can, you know, if my arm is all the way up here, then it ex can extend from 1 to 2. And then the points between here are some sort of a complicated curve between the two. Um, but this distance is 1, and then this total distance here is 2. However, I could also have my arm pointed the other direction when it's straight up. And so in that case, the only thing that I could hit over here is from 1 to 2. Let's go ahead and let's look at an animation of that. So here's that first projection, and we can see this arm is going up here. And here's that second solution. So you can see that when we have our arm that's totally flat, so this distance projected down is 1, it's full length, and then we can extend from 1 to 2, and we get these two circular arcs, which are the square root of 2 in length and the square root of 5 in length. This final plane, we can grab this cyan-colored region here, if the arm is all the way down, then that extent is from square root of 2 all the way out to square root of 5 when it's fully extended, whereas the top is easier to understand because it's always one distance away or two in distance. And then we have this linear region of the workspace that we just hit over here. That region is a little bit easier to see in this picture here. And so here is our cut line. As we tip that off to the side, you can see that the intersection here is that line right here and then this patch on this side see as I rotate that through. I'd like to just briefly mention that the region at the left does have parametric equation answers for it. You can read the solution here, which you can derive from the forward kinematics. And now it's finally time to do the inverse kinematics. And so there are three variables we need to know. We've got our theta 2, our d3 star, and our theta 1. And we could solve these in any order, but almost always it turns out that there's one of these variables which we can find independent of the other ones. And so you want to look at these and figure out which they are. I've given you a hint here. It turns out that theta 2 is easier to find because it doesn't depend on anything. And we can see that by looking at this first drawing that we have here. You notice that the height, so the height that it is above the ground, that is zc. And that height is entirely a function. First you go up 1 to this joint, and then you go up the distance that we have rotated, theta 2, and then this height here, this component of height here, is just the sine of theta 2 times the length of this arm, which in this case is 1. So that means that theta 2 
can be derived from that. Let's just write out that equation that we have. So we have that zc is equal to 1 plus the sine of theta 2. And so then we can invert that equation and we get zc minus 1. We'll take that quantity and they'll arc sine it. And then we get our answer. So you could also write this as the arc sine of zc minus 1. And so we've got our first one. The next one that we have is d3 star and theta 1. And it'll be easier, since I've already messed up these pictures pretty well, is to draw it out. And so I've put that on the next page. So here we are. We're looking down on that base frame. This link over here is our, our link 2. But it's not exactly link 2. Remember, uh, we're projecting this downward, so it's just a cosine of the link. So we've got the length is 1 times this cosine of theta 2. That's this length over here. Whereas this length here is always going to be parallel. This is the, the D3 link. It's always going to be parallel to the X0, zero, Y0 zero plane. So its length is D3. And that's it can be changed. So we need to think about the things that we know. Well, we only know XC, YC, and ZC. But when we project that in the plane, we can drop out what the ZC value is. So this is just XC, YC. That's that coordinate. And so this length, which I'm going to go ahead and call this r, by the Pythagoras theorem, r is equal to the root of xc squared plus yc squared. And so now we've got the r value is one side of this triangle, the c is the other side of the, the triangle, and so we can again apply Pythagorean theorem. And so the Pythagorean theorem says that d3 star quantity squared is equal to plus c2 squared is equal to xc squared plus yc squared. And so that means that d3 star is equal to xc squared plus yc squared minus c2 squared, and take that entire quantity, the root of it. And there we have our solution. Now we know what d3 star is. Now the only thing we have left is our theta 1. And remember, our theta 1 is the angle that we have turned all the way over to here. That is theta 1. It's a little bit hard to pull out of this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to decompose this problem. So we've got this, this arm that comes over here. And then this extends over here. That's our d3 value. And then we've got our, our dotted line here. That's our r, d3 star. And this is c2 over here. And what we want to know, we want to know what theta 1 is. So I'm going to say, go theta 1 star. That is going to be this angle from here all the way to here. I don't know what that is. But what I can do is I can figure out some intermediate angles. And so I could figure out what is this angle to that radial line here. I could also figure out what is this interior angle over here. So I'm going to call that interior angle alpha. And I'm going to call this exterior angle beta. And I'll say that theta 1 star is equal to the summation of alpha plus beta. Now, of course, all I have to do is solve for those. But beta is easy because beta is equal to, if you, this point here is just xc, yc. And so I can do my a tan 2 of my xc, yc. And I've got beta. To do alpha, my alpha value is my interior angle. I can again do my arctangent 2. Arctangent 2 and then my side value over here is my C2 value and my value along here is my D3 star. So my total theta 1 star is equal to a tan 2 of C2 D3 star plus a tan 2 of XC YC. And there I've got my solution. And so with all three of these answers, I have solved my inverse kinematics. If the answer that they give for these theta 2, d3 star, and theta 1 is in my allowed range. 
So only if theta 2 is in the range from 0 to pi over 2, and d3 is in the range from 1 to 2, and theta 1 is in the range from 0 to pi. If it's outside these ranges, then that's an unreachable set. It's outside my workspace. To finish, let's just look at that workspace again. And so here I'm rotating that workspace around and then moving the three parameters around the perimeter of that workspace. You can see as we're sketching out that front contour there. And here we're going to sketch out the top of that workspace there. So just move it through there. And now that you've solved both the forward and the inverse kinematics, I hope you have a greater appreciation of this robot's workspace. Have a great day.